Merle, memory to me is one of those fascinating probes because very smart people, neuroscientists, envision it incurring. We call it the engram. That, where is that memory stored? At vastly orders of magnitude differences from the micro quantum level that some people say to the cellular, to the synapse between neurons, to several neurons, to, to, to circuits of neurons, to whole brains, and some people go outside of the brain to, to say memories where memories are stored. Right. So I, I want to ask you, as an expert on Alzheimer's disease, which undermines memory, what can we learn about memory from when we see its destruction through Alzheimer's? The question of where memory is stored in the brain, or even if it's stored within the brain, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, are we storing on the cloud somewhere, as is a popular term now, I don't think we have the definitive answer yet. I think the answer may be partially true to both. I think we're storing some memories in the brain, some memories are in the cloud, and some memories are completely reconstructed by us. And let me give you uh, some examples. First of all, we tend to think of memory as a thing, like a pen. It's not a thing. It's not something that a pen you put in a drawer and you pick it up. Memory is so, it's a constructive process in the brain. Mm. The brain constructs the memory fresh every time you recollect something. That's a fascinating point. There are three steps involved in memory. So the first step is the sensory perception. So if I want to remember something, you know, I'm getting the information either from my touch, from my vision, from my hearing, and each of us hears touches, feels things in a slightly different way. No two people's eyesight, hearing, etc., is the same. So that's one reason why two people may see the same thing, but their input is slightly different. So in that sense, it's a little bit like a computer. You know, on the computer screen, you're typing some information, you're inputting some information. The first time the information enters the brain, it enters a part of your memory called working memory. So working memory is kind of like a temporary scratch pad, if you will. It's kind of like the computer screen. It's a temporary file. It hasn't been saved anywhere. The computer thinks this is not important stuff. If I crash, you know, I let it, let it all go away. RAM it's, no, memory. it's RAM memory, exactly. <laughs> so your working memory, uh, we don't know exactly where it is, but we think maybe the hippocampus and the frontal lobe is very important for working memory. And our working memory is very limited. It can only house a little bit of information. It's like, you know, your temporary memory. Once we attach some importance to that memory, either emotional importance, safety importance, whatever, or if we practice it over and over again. Yeah, focus on it. Focus on it. Uh, or we practice over and over again. We repeat the mm -hmm. same thing. Then the brain says, this is important stuff. I got to keep it. And then what it does is the ultimate mystery. <laughs> it then, like I, 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 so the current thinking is it then breaks that information down into thousands, maybe hundreds, maybe millions of bits. And then it distributes them throughout the brain. That's all we know. That's where our knowledge stops. Now, every time we try to recollect something, it then reconstructs that entire new memory, which is completely context dependent. We know that there are several regions critical for this reconstruction process. We know the hippocampus is very important, the entorhinal cortex is very important because lesions in each of these areas have produced certain specific forms of memory loss, but that doesn't mean that that's where the memory is stored. It just means that the circuit has been interrupted there and the brain is not able to reconstruct the information fully. There are other times as we get older, for example, we get a little slower in recalling something that means something is going wrong with the reconstructing information process. There are yet other times where we have a false memory, which means as the brain is reconstructing information, it's pulling stuff out from some wrong basket. Mm. <laughs> What's incredible is that we have literally millions of memories in different forms. And if they're all stored globally in the brain and broken up into millions of pieces, the reconstruction process just seems astonishing. Right. <laughs> that algorithm must be mind-blowing. Uh, there's got to be some simpler ways of doing it because a lot of that is related to some basic elements. So if you take a rose, for example, we might break a rose down into its color. We might break it down into, I got pricked by its thorn, so that's got a fear element to it. I gave a rose to my fiance before I got engaged, so it's got a love and emotion. Of, you know, and you see bouquets you give people for your secretary on her birthday. So the brain has to sort of take into account all of these past memories. And using your past memories, that's how it creates the present memory. Mm. So it's predictive. 
because it says, what are all the ways when I want this picture of the rose to come in the future? Mm. What are all the pieces of information I'm going to need at hand to process it effectively? And that's how it stores it. Mm. You made a comment uh, that uh, possibly some of this could be stored in the cloud. Right. I let that pass because I'm fascinated about all of this, but I'm not going to let it pass forever because that is a, it sounds to me, it sounded very normal when you said it, but it's a very controversial kind of comment. Extremely controversial. Is there a collective consciousness? Is there a collective memory? Uh, do we use, and at its simplistic level, we might simply rely on environmental triggers. So instead of storing everything inside, we might just take what's outside and then use that information on the context. Mm -hmm. So that's a simplistic way of thinking about the cloud. Yeah. And but some it, philosophers now say that human consciousness must involve some externalities right. in, in, in a strong sense, not right. just in the obvious sense. And I'll tell you a fascinating experimental paradigm that uh, uh, people are just now starting to take uh, very seriously. It's a process called hibernation. And there is a little animal, it's called the Arctic squirrel, that's been studied now for a couple of decades. When it hibernates in the winter, its body temperature drops by about 30 degrees. Its brain activity slows down. There is massive neuronal destruction in the brain. But yet, when it wakes up, all of its neurons are reformed. So one of the interesting experiments someone wanted to do was, if I bury a a nut that this particular Arctic squirrel loves, and I show the Arctic squirrel where I'm burying the nut just before it goes into hibernation. If the memory was truly stored in the brain and all these synapses were destroyed, when it came out of hibernation, it wouldn't be able to find it. But on the other hand, if it's not stored in the brain physically, it's stored in some cloud. When it came out of hibernation, it would be able to find it. And, and these squirrels are able to find the nut. Yeah. I'm not sure the conclusion is <laughs> entirely justified from I the agree. data, unless I have a lot of other... I, I agree, I agree. <laughs> no, no, I... I but but it, it's... It's, it, I, it's I like using other cues as well. You know, it's, it's probably using its sense of smell. It's maybe finding it freshly. You know, this experiment is not definite. Or maybe it. every, every uh, synapse is not being destroyed. I, I completely understand. The brain might have multiple backup systems and multiple alternate pathways. And right. even in a hibernating right. animal, there are basic brain systems that are still going to keep the animal... Right, right. Alive. Right. So, so alive. you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, I but, just, but I admire the uh, the, the guts to uh, to try to uh, study, uh, to something. study right. something that other people would say you shouldn't even touch. It's very hard to study, you know, because you could take brain dead people perhaps and do some experiments. You know, people who have had serious brain injuries and the memory systems have been destroyed. You can never isolate it's it. It's very difficult to isolate. And, and the problem is, is that if, you're, if, if the claim is you're storing a memory in some non-physical right. way, right. it's almost impossible to fully uh, approve that in a physical right. manner. It's almost a contradiction in terms. Right. And Alzheimer's disease is a, an example that neuroscientists would use to say, look, if the Alzheimer's patients were storing their memory in a cloud somewhere, then why are they having such severe disability and memory loss? Why are they forgetting how to drive a car? Why are they forgetting the face of their spouse that they have known for 60 years? Right, and the argument of those folks who I talked to too uh, is that, uh, well, they still have the memory, but they've just lost the ability to recall it. I think that's a cop-out. Could be a cop-out. Uh, but they've been, they said the same thing for Parkinson's patients until they came up with a drug that woke them up from their you know, Parkinson-induced stupor, and all of a sudden, all their memories were there. Mm -hmm. They're comatose patients whose brain activity is uh, so badly damaged, and they come out of coma. There had been one patient who came out of coma 20 years later. And even though she didn't have a memory for the period where she was in coma, she still was able to recollect past information fairly accurately. So, so there's evidence that goes both ways. And, uh, you know, it's, like I said, we don't know that much about where the memory is stored in the brain. But what's, what is critical is that this concept of, of, of how memories are stored, where they are, is really uh, uh, enormously probative of, of what we understand human mind consciousness to, to be about. Sure. And it's still the case that very smart people vary it, not where in the brain, but enormous orders of magnitude. Yes. So, we so there is a saying about the brain which uh, I love and which neuroscientists hate, even though I'm a neuroscientist. It goes something like this. If the brain were so simple that we could understand it, then we would be so simple that we could not understand it. <laughs>